Democracy Now! special, we spend the hour with Noam Chomsky, the world-renowned political dissident, linguist, author, and institute professor emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he's taught for more than half a century. Noam Chomsky has penned more than a hundred books, his newest, Because We Say So, a collection of his columns. On Saturday, Noam Chomsky spoke before a sold-out audience of nearly 1,000 people at the New School's auditorium here in New York City. Chomsky discussed the persistence of U.S. exceptionalism, Republican efforts to torpedo the Iran nuclear deal, and the normalization of U.S.-Cuba relations. Professor Chomsky also explained why he believes the U.S. and its closest allies, namely Saudi Arabia and Israel, are undermining prospects for peace in the Middle East. His speech was titled On Power and Ideology. The role of concentrated power in shaping the ideological framework uh, that dominates uh, perception, uh, interpretation, discussion, choice of action. Uh, all of that is uh, too familiar to require much comment. Uh, tonight, I'd like to discuss a critically important example. Uh, but first, uh, a couple of words on one of the most uh, perceptive analysts of this process, uh, George Orwell. Uh, Orwell is famous for his searching and uh, sardonic critique of the way thought is controlled by force uh, under totalitarian dystopia. But much less is not known is his discussion of how similar outcomes are achieved in free societies. He's speaking, of course, of England, and he wrote that although the country is quite free, uh, nevertheless, unpopular ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. Gave a couple of examples, provided a few words of explanation, which were to the point. One particularly pertinent comment was his observation on a quality education in the best schools where it is instilled into you that there are certain things that it simply wouldn't do to say, or we may add, even to think. Uh, one reason why not much attention is paid to this essay is that it wasn't published. It was found decades later in his unpublished papers. It was intended as the introduction to his famous animal farm, bitter satire of Stalinist totalitarianism. Uh, why it wasn't published is apparently unknown, but uh, I think perhaps you can speculate. Uh, Orwell's uh, observations on thought control under freedom uh, come to mind in considering the raging debate today about the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, which currently occupies center stage. I should say it's a raging debate in the United States, virtually alone. Uh, in almost everywhere else, the deal has been greeted with relief and optimism and without even a parliamentary review. Uh, this is one of the many striking examples of the famous uh, concept of American exceptionalism. Uh, the fact that uh, America is an exceptional nation is regularly intoned by virtually every political figure, and I think more revealingly, uh, the same is true of prominent uh, academic and public intellectuals. You can select almost at random, take for example the Professor of the Science of Government at Harvard, is a distinguished liberal scholar, government advisor. Uh, he's writing in Harvard's uh, prestigious journal, International Security, and there he explains that unlike other countries, the national identity of the United States is defined by a set of universal political and economic values, namely liberty, democracy, equality, private property, and markets. So the U.S. has a solemn duty to maintain its international primacy 
for the benefit of the world. And uh, since this is a matter of definition, uh, we can dispense with the tedious work of uh, empirical verification. So I won't uh, spend any time on that. Uh, or let's turn to the leading left liberal intellectual journal, the New York Review. Uh, there, a couple of months ago, we read from the uh, former chair of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace that American contributions to international security, global economic growth, freedom, and human well-being have been so self-evidently unique and have been so clearly directed to others' benefit that Americans have long believed that the United States amounts to a different kind of country. While others push their national interests, the United States tries to advance universal principles. Uh, no evidence is given because it's, again, <laughs> a matter of definition. That's very easy to continue. Uh, it's only fair to add that there's nothing at all exceptional about this. American exceptionalism was uh, standard for uh, every great power, uh, very familiar from other imperial states in their days in the sun, uh, Britain, France, others. And this is true, interestingly, even from very honorable figures from whom one might have expected bet better. So John Stuart Mill, for example, in England, to mention a significant case, which raises interesting questions about uh, intellectual life and intellectual standards. Well, in some respects, American exceptionalism is not in doubt. I just mentioned one example, the current Iran nuclear deal. Uh, here, the exceptionalism of the United States, its isolation, is dramatic and stark. Now, there are actually many other cases, but this is the one I'd like to think about this evening. And in fact, uh, U.S isolation might soon increase. The Republican organization, I hesitate to say party, is dedicated to undermining the deal uh, in interesting ways with the kind of unanimity that one doesn't find in political parties, though it's familiar in such former organizations as the old Communist Party democratic centralism. Everyone has to say the same thing. That's one of many indications that the Republicans are no longer a political party in the normal sense, despite uh, pretensions, uh, commentary, and so on. Noam Chomsky speaking Saturday at the New School in New York. When we come back, he addresses Iran, Cuba, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the U.S. presidential elections in a moment. که ما همو نکشیم به هم نگاه بد نکنیم با هم دوست باشیم و دست بندازیم بوشونه های هم آها مثل بچه گیا تو دبستان هیچ کدوممون هم نیستیم بیکار در حال ساخت و ساز ایران واسه این که خسته نشیم بار من خش بذارم تو سیما بعد این همه بارون خون بالاخره پیداش میشه رنگین کمون دیگه از سنگ ابر نمیشه آسمون به سرخی لاله نمیشه آب جو معزن از آن بگو خدا بزرگ بلا به دور مامان امشب واسمون دعا بفر جای که یادم این خاک همیشه ندا میداد یه روز خوب میاد که هر جو مرج نیست و تو شلوغیا به جا پوش به هم شیرینی میدیم و زول بیا گامیه همه شنگولی و همه چیالیه فقط جای رفیقامون که نیستن ایرانیان رپ آرتست هیچکاس ا نو دی ویل کام دس از دموکراسی ناو دموکراسی ناو دات اورگ دی وارن پیس رپورت آی میمی گودمن از وی اسپند دی اور ویت ام آی تی پروفسور اوتر اکتیویست پولیتیکل دیسیدنت نوم چامسکی اوور دی ویکند هی اسپوک تو a packed audience at the new school here in New York City. The former Republican Party has now become a radical insurgency that's abandoned parliamentary politics. I'm quoting two highly respected 
very conservative political commentators, Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein of the right-wing American Enterprise Institute. And in fact, uh, they may succeed in increasing sanctions and even secondary sanctions on other countries and carry out other actions that could lead Iran to opt out of the deal uh, with the United States. With the United States, that is. Uh, that, however, need not mean that the agreement is nullified. Uh, contrary to the way it's sometimes presented here, it's not a U.S.-Iran agreement. It's an agreement between Iran and what's called P5 plus one, the five veto holding members of the Security Council plus Germany. And the other participants might agree uh, to proceed, Iran as well. Uh, they would then join uh, China and India, uh, which have already been finding ways to evade the uh, U.S. Uh, constraints on uh, 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 interactions with, uh, with uh, Iran. And in fact, if they do, they'll join the large majority of the world's population, the non-aligned movement, which all along has vigorously supported uh, Iran's right to pursue its nuclear programs as a member of the NPT. Uh, but remember that they're not part of the international community. So when we say the international community opposes Iran's policies or the international community does some other thing, that means the United States and anybody else who happens to be going along with it. Uh, so we can dismiss them. Uh, if others continue to honor the deal, which could happen, uh, the United States will be isolated from the world, which is not an unfamiliar position. That's also the background for uh, the other element of Obama's, what's called Obama's legacy, his other main foreign policy achievement, uh, the beginning of normalization of relations with Cuba. On Cuba, the United States has been almost totally isolated for decades. If you look, say, at the annual votes in the U UN General Assembly on the U.S. embargo, they're rarely reported, but uh, the U.S. essentially votes alone. Uh, the last one, Israel joined. Uh, but of course, Israel violates the embargo. They just have to join because have to join with the master. Occasionally, the Marshall Islands or Palau or someone else joins. And in the hemisphere, the United States is, has been totally isolated for years. The main hemispheric conferences uh, have uh, foundered uh, because the United States will simply not join uh, the rest of the hemisphere in the major issues that are discussed. Last one in Colombia, uh, the two major issues were uh, admitting Cuba into the hemisphere. Uh, U.S. and Canada refused, everyone else agreed. And uh, the U.S. drug war, which is devastating Latin America, and they want to get out of it, uh, but the U.S. and Canada don't agree. Uh, that's actually the background for Obama's Agree acceptance of uh, steps towards normalization of relations with Cuba. Another hemispheric conference was coming up in Panama, and if the United States had not made that move, it probably would have been thrown out of the hemisphere. Uh, so therefore, Obama made what's called here a noble gesture, a, a courageous uh, move to end Cuba's isolation. Uh, although in reality it was U.S. isolation that was the motivating factor. So if the United States ends up being uh, almost uh, universally isolated in Iran, uh, that won't be anything particularly new, and in fact there are quite a few other cases. Well, in the case of Iran, uh, the reasons for U.S. concerns are very clearly and uh, repeatedly uh, articulated. Iran is the gravest threat to world peace. Uh, we hear that regularly from high places. Government officials, 
commentators and others in the United States. Uh, there also happens to be a world out there, and it has its own opinions. It's quite easy to find these out from standard sources, like the, the main U.S. polling agency, Gallup Polls, takes regular polls of international opinion. And one of the questions that posed is posed is, which country do you think is the gravest threat to world peace? Uh, the answer is unequivocal. Uh, the United States, by a huge margin, uh, way behind in second place is Pakistan. It's inflated, surely, by the Indian vote, and then come a couple of others. <laughs> Uh, Iran is mentioned, but along with uh, Israel and a few others, way down. Uh, that's, uh, that's one of the things that it wouldn't do to say. And in fact, the results that are found by the leading U.S. polling agency uh, didn't make it through the portals of what we call the free press. But it doesn't go away for that reason. Well, given the... Uh, reigning doctrine about the gravity of the Iranian threat, uh, we can understand the virtually unanimous stand that the United States is entitled to react with military force, uh, unilaterally of course, if it claims to detect some Iranian departure uh, from the terms of the agreement. So again,